Please take your Bibles and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1. I hope you realize wood milk is not real, as she said. It's a parody. But we are surrounded in our society by many such artificial alternatives. You can go to a coffee shop and get non-dairy creamers, almond milk, oat milk, or coconut to accent your cup of joe. You can stir it into Folgers crystals if you really wanted to get particular about what constitutes coffee or not. You can go to BK and have it your way with an impossible whopper. You can get purses and clothing that are made from cork leather. You can fill up your tank with corn-based ethanol or biodiesel. Fabrics like cotton, linen, and wool have been supplemented and supplanted by fibers like polyester, nylon, and spandex. And here in the Midwest, what once spreads on bread has been a matter of heated debate and contention over the years. Uh, We are in Minnesota, but across the border, some of you grew up in Wisconsin. And did you know that until 1967, it was illegal to sell yellow-colored margarine or oleo margarine in grocery stores in Wisconsin? And to this day, if you go across the border, in institutions and restaurants in America's Dairyland, they can only provide margarine upon request. They cannot provide it as a readily available substitute for butter. Violators are subject to a fine of up to $500 and a jail sentence of up to three months. So they take their dairy seriously over there. While synthetics and substitutes may have their supporters, there's also been a movement to reclaim what is real. Mexican Coke. Anybody like Mexican Coke? Why is that valued by so many? Because it is sweetened with pure cane sugar instead of corn syrup that's commonly found here in the United States and other places. And as far as I know, if you're talking just taste, nobody really wants turkey bacon. Okay? There's even a growing trend of recorded music With all the benefits that we have with digital media, vinyl records are making a comeback. Lo-fi recordings, which feature sounds typically removed in studio recordings like electric static or the sound of fingers or capos uh, moving on instruments, those things have actually become really popular these days. There's a certain market that really enjoys hearing some of those things. They want the real experience. But when it comes to matters of faith, today's passage that we're in, 2 Timothy chapter 1, is going to show us that both God and people value honesty. They value sincerity. We admire people that we know who demonstrate genuine faith. Paul commends here in 2 Timothy chapter 1 his protege, Timothy, for exhibiting sincere faith even as he credits others for what he sees in Timothy. One of the most significant figures in the New Testament in early Christianity became so because of the influence of what we could arguably say was his single mom. 2 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Hear the Word of God. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy." I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. For this reason I remind you to fan into the flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. This is the word of God inerrant, infallible, inspired, written by God and written for us that we might know what to believe, that we might know how to live, and that on its pages we might meet the living Christ. May God add his blessing here to the reading of his word this morning. 
What I want you to see, if you use the outline that's on the back of your worship guide and you're following along with this outline, we're going to understand, first of all, that God provides us as human beings with stability. He provides stability to the household that Timothy grew up in, and he does so through, first of all, through time. He provides stability through time. Who were this Eunice? Who were Lois that he talks about in the passage? Well, we just see them named here specifically, and he says Lois is Timothy's grandmother, and Eunice is his mother. What do we know about them beyond that? Well, they're mentioned, for example, even though they're not named, in Acts chapter 16 and verse 1. Luke records this, Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there, and he names him, his name is Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. What we know about her very little is really what it says there in that passage and what it says here in 2 Timothy chapter 1. But what we do know is that she was a Jewish woman. She was a believer. She understood Jesus was her Messiah. And we understand as well that what she had to do in raising him, whether it was specifically as a believer and her husband was an unbeliever, or it's also possible that what we see here, because in 2 Timothy 1 it says he's raised by his mother and his grandmother, we have to at least allow for the possibility that the father wasn't really in the picture, whether he had died or he had left her or, or, or something else had happened. He was raised in a household where his mother was the key figure and his grandmother was the supplementary figure. And he had, from earliest days, that kind of influence in his life. Mothers having to overcome the challenges, the difficulties that they faced, but also the reality that they had a truth to proclaim. That there was something there that was significant, that even vital to what they needed to do for her son, for her grandson. Timothy had an example right from the beginning that this was a household that loved Jesus Christ, that gave out the reality of faith. Paul says that I see this faith in you, Timothy, and I know where you got it from. It came from your grandmother. It came from your mother. And what is that faith? It's not just a way of life. It's the object of who that faith is in. Luke says in in Acts chapter 16 that the mother believed. She believed in Jesus. And friend, that's possible that even some of you are here today maybe because mom encouraged you or because it was something that you felt it was good to do for the sake of keeping the family together. But you know why your mom wants you here? Among other things, his mom wants you to hear that Jesus Christ died for you. That you, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you can be forgiven of your sins. You can have assurance of salvation. You can have hope, not just in this life, but in what is to come. Because we are separated from God because of our sin. The Bible tells us that there is none righteous, not even one. No one understands. No one seeks after God. But the Bible also tells us that Jesus died on the cross to bear those consequences that we deserve for our sin. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. He makes that available to us. And Jesus Himself would say that God loved the world so much that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes, whoever puts their faith and trust in Him will not perish, will not die, but instead, He will have, she will have everlasting, eternal life. And whatever else faith might be, that's where it begins. Faith in Jesus. That is our hope. And that is what mom wants you to know. That's what Timothy's mother and grandmother taught him from the earliest ages. There, through the trouble, through the time and difficulty that they experienced, 
from Timothy's earliest memories. He was raised in a home where they talked about Jesus, where he knew that he needed to believe in Jesus. The faith that we demonstrate, the faith that God gives us in that time of belief, in the time of our earliest childhood, is a faith that can give us stability through tears. Paul references this in this passage, if you look it back to our main, where we started off in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 4. Paul says to Timothy, I remember your tears, and as I remember them, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. We know that as children grow up, you see the passing of time. We're getting ready next week to honor our high school graduates. And this is the time of, uh, time of life where parents start to say, well, where did all the years go? You know, we have these little children up here on the platform. In just a few years, they're not going to be up here in Sunday school class. They're going to be in youth group. They're going to be in college. They're going to be having their own kids. It's the way the cycle works. But sometimes it seems like the years go by in a flash even as also the days just stretch out for long, long, long periods of time. But we lose the track of it in those things. And over the tears of realizing I've lost that opportunity, I've lost that influence, the window is closing. There is also, for mothers, the reality that I don't have that same kind of opportunity. I don't have that same kind of influence. I'm going to challenge some of you mothers who are here this morning who still are holding those squirmy little ones in your laps. Remember, that window is short. Remember, that opportunity for influence is finite. You will not have them indefinitely. You will always have them in your life, but they will not always listen to you the way that they're listening today. How are you using that influence how much of our priority is spent on making sure that we have adequate finances or that I'm advancing in my career and we spin off some of the most crucial formative years and put them in institutional care or other things. And I'm not trying to advocate for one method of education or another. That's, that's not my point here this morning. My point is simply to remind you that window is limited. Use the influences that you have and use them and steward them well. I want to also just note that here in this passage, it's not just the mother who makes that a priority. It's the grandmother. And There's ways that some of you ladies who maybe your time and your opportunity for influence isn't quite the same as it was for your mothers when, when you had children in your home. But you still can supplement, whether it's your own biological offspring, or as I know some people in this church have done, take the time to be a surrogate grandmother, to take the time to be that influence and support someone who has got to go out and work for their own, work to provide for their family. But you can be that opportunity for spiritual influence. Some of you are doing that actually in home. Some of you do that in other ways, like you labor here in our children's ministries. You we're already now, Pastor John was talking about looking for people who are willing to teach, willing to, you, to work in our summer children's program. That's an opportunity for some of you, ladies and men too, to be that kind of influence, to help children establish and support what parents are establishing in, those, in their minds, the truth of Jesus Christ, the reality of the Gospel. Do it through the tears before you have the regrets, before you wish that somebody else would have made that priority. There is an anxiety that comes through the separation of tears. But don't make that anxiety be because you neglected your responsibility. Bring them together again. Make sure that when you are reunited, it won't just be at family gatherings and, and times where we're having family celebrations. We'll see you on the other side. We'll see you around the throne. I remember singing a song some of you might remember singing when you grew up as well. Shall we gather at the river? 
and, and where bright angel feet have trod, where its crystals hide forever, flows around the throne of God. And then the chorus, yes, we'll gather at the river. We'll gather with the saints at the river that flows by the throne of God. That should be true of all believers, but especially true of a home where even as you face feign death and loss, what unites you is your hope in Jesus Christ. Make sure you make that story, make sure you make that message a priority, moms, with your kids. Take the time to read God's Word. Take the time to tell the stories, and not just the stories of characters, but where their faith lied, where their faith was anchored in the person of Jesus Christ. And God will help you do that through time, through tears, and through trouble. In verse 7 of the passage that we're reading this morning, Paul tells Timothy, God has given us not a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. The reality is we have a lot of misgivings and a lot of anxieties. We have fears because are we going to have enough money? Are we going to have enough opportunities for my child to succeed if they're not maybe in this education program or this sports or this kind of thing or another? And we get confused sometimes because we allow the world to influence us on what should the most important thing should be in our children's lives. What is the most vital thing? And it's not unimportant. It's not irrelevant to a child for what they're going to do for a career. It's not irrelevant or inconsequential for a child not to have food, money, and resources. But we must also remember that we are laying up for ourselves treasures, not on earth, Jesus says, where moth and rust corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. We are laying up treasures in heaven. That is our goal. That is our priority. And what is going to last in the life of your child is not whether they had a good value of money or they had uh, the, the top grades in their class or whether they were the highest athletic achiever, though there's a place for all of that. If you are successful in teaching your children all those things, but not successful in embedding for them the habits of what it means to love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, if you are not successful in establishing for them that the thing that matters when you sit down at the table is to give thanks to God, to express reliance and faith and dependence on Him, and model that in how you go to church, in what you read and share those experiences together, or if you're constantly farming them off to other people to manage for you, if you're constantly diminishing that priority because there's a game on or there's some other activity that should be more important, then friend, you are teaching your children priorities. but They're not the right ones. We need to have homes that put God first. A lot of times, dads, that responsibility is on you. But moms, you're part of that process as well. And if dads aren't doing it, moms, what we see here in Scripture is a model of a mother who saw that where dad wasn't going to step in, or maybe dad couldn't step in or wouldn't step in, she was committed to making sure that happened. We must do so through trouble, through challenges, through difficulties. Paul says to the Philippians in Philippians 4, verse 6, Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Are you a mother that models prayer? Are you a mother that shows her confidence in God? Both privately and in front of your kids. Do they have a model they can follow? because of your activity, because of your example. So friends, if we understand that God has given us stability, what is our response to it? Well, as we used to sing again when I was a kid, when we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. 
When we do His good will, He abides with us still. And to all who will, trust and obey. And so what does that mean for us? To trust God, to have our faith in Him? We must also follow. That means we have to start by believing, but we also have to be committed to learning. Believe and learn. Paul tells Timothy, I have saw your sincere, your real faith right from the beginning. I've seen it in you, and I know that you got it from your grandmother, Lois, from your mother, Eunice. Later on, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he says, how did you get it? How did they pass on that faith? Verse 15 of 2 Timothy chapter 3, from childhood you have been acquainted with with the sacred writing, says the ESV. If you memorized it in a different translation, it might say the Holy Scriptures, the things that God gave you. This is talking about the Old Testament for Timothy, because the New Testament is still being written as Paul is writing 2 Timothy. But it is the Scripture, it is this book, Paul says, that is able to make people wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good works. Why did Timothy know the Scriptures? It wasn't because he went to Awana. It wasn't because he went to Kids for Truth. It wasn't because he went to Sunday school. Although those are all good things for kids to do. Why does Paul say that, he, that, that Timothy knew those things? Because his mother and his grandmother reinforced them. And I want to again make this clear. That's not to, to disparage children's programs like we have here at Calvary. But I know even in our household, my kids knew their sections, not because we threw a book at them and said, okay kids, it's your responsibility. Parents had to go through the discipline of that with them. Moms had to say, hey, do you have your sections down this week? And even sometimes if she didn't have time to go through it individually with each child, she could say, okay, Dory, can you work with Reggie to make sure he has his verses down this week? That's how it works in our household. There, there's some, some management, there's some delegation going on in the household. But somebody has to give attention to it. You can't just say, the kids know this, this is their routine. You let them go, they're not going to do it. They're going to say, hey, can I play with the Nintendo? Or they're not even going to ask. They're just going to do it. If, we, if you give them free reign, you have to help them be disciplined. You have to help them be committed. It's an important thing to do. It's worth the priority. Make sure that you believe it and that you're investing in enough both for you to learn it and modeling before them that example to keep learning it as well. This is what Paul would tell Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in the suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hard-working farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. And again, what's important here? It's not just sometimes we get this idea that to be a good Christian pastor expects you to be an egghead all the time, and, and let's read through entire books of the Bible uh, as a family. You see what the examples that Paul gives? He uses athletics. He uses agriculture. He uses the military as illustrations to connect God's truth to Timothy. And ladies and gentlemen, both, as you're acting as mother and fathers in your household, there's that opportunity for that kind of discipleship to take place. I'm not saying it has to be a choice between whether you're serious about church or serious about athletics. Why can't it be both? Why can't you use that as a venue to promote excellence, to promote a spirit of commitment, of endurance, of the benefit 
of hard work and repetition and discipline? Why can't you bring some of those things to bear to light when you're doing your summer gardening project or when you're going to can it later on this fall? Why can't those things connect? Why can't your children be helped to understand that we live the way we do because God has entrusted these responsibilities to us? They are not unrelated, is what I'm trying to tell you. Believe it and find ways to learn it yourself so that you can pass it on to others. You teach and model as much as you believe and you learn. That's the second point. The third point is that Paul tells them that they need to love sacrificially. Mothers are renowned for doing that. A good mother loves her children. She makes the sacrifices. And even as we talked a few weeks ago, as our study in Genesis and our regular study, that whether or not you're married, the marriage relationship gives us a picture of of better how to understand our relationship with Christ and with each other, so does motherhood give us a good example, a good model for all believers to follow to help us understand what does sacrificial love looks like. Paul doesn't say, I'm mothering you, Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10, but certainly we can picture the kind of relationship he's envisioning to Timothy that he has with him in 2 Timothy chapter 3. In verse 10, he says, You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me in Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse deceiving and being deceived. What he's saying is, I did these things even though there were challenges, there were difficulties, it wasn't the easiest thing to do. And you should also expect resistance. You should expect opposition and difficulty. And mothers who know this, you know that when you love your children, when you're trying to do what's best for them, it's not the easiest thing to do. There's a lot of different priorities competing for your attention. Expect the difficulties, but be prepared for the difficulties. But also be resolved to love through those things. Verse 14, As for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. Be committed to believing. Be committed to having that real, that sincere faith. The point I want you to remember as we conclude the passage this morning and conclude our message is that just like Timothy modeled for, or had modeled before him by Paul, as he mentioned his mother and he's mentioned his grandmother, keep faith, keep believing, be real, be sincere. But share that hope with others. It's not just something that you believe, it's something that you give to others because you love them and because you love God. That's what a good mother is going to do. She's going to teach her children to believe. She's going to model the hope because she loves her child. That's the kind of mother I had. It's the kind of mother so many of you had. It's the kind of mother so many of you out here in the congregation are. And friends, we thank God for you and your influence. And we pray for you regularly. Father, we do thank you for the love that you demonstrated to us by sending your son Jesus Christ to die for our sins, to give himself as a sacrifice, to provide what we could not provide for ourselves. And Lord, that kind of love is illustrated for us in the kind of sacrifices mothers make. They give of themselves, sometimes quite literally of themselves, in the birthing and the feeding and the other things that the sacrifices that are done to bring a new life into the world they give of themselves they give sacrificially lord we thank you for these vivid and explicit pictures that you have given to us that personify for us what your love for us looks like the the depths of the sacrifices that you make so that we 
who are dead could be given life. We thank you, Lord, for the women that you have placed into our lives, the children uh, that you have gifted them with, the opportunities for influence. We know that there are many even sitting out here this morning who have those windows of opportunity. So, Lord, help those mothers and grandmothers who have gone on now to the next phase of their lives uh, to find ways to speak wisdom, to speak truth to them, to encourage them, whether it be from examples that they benefited from positively or whether it be with the reality of lost opportunity and missed opportunities for influence. Learn from my mistakes so that you don't repeat them. Lord, that's why you've put us into a congregation like this, so that we can benefit each other, encourage each other, and build each other up. Lord, we thank you for the gift of the children that you've given us in this congregation, and even as we heard them sing and give gratitude and thankfulness for their mothers, we also thank you for those who are pointing them in that direction, teaching them gratitude, teaching them faith. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to be faithful and continue in that till your Son returns to prepare hearts to meet their Savior. For this we pray in his name. Amen.